Hello once again everyone. This video is an introduction about DNA replication. DNA replication is a complex process and in this introductory video we will be talking about its definition, some of the important concepts that you need to remember to understand this process, and the three hypotheses about DNA replication. Another video will be made about the DNA replication process itself. So what is DNA replication? By definition, DNA replication is the process when a double-stranded DNA is copied or replicated, and at the end of the process, we have two DNA molecules that are the same or identical to the original DNA molecule. Now we know the basic definition of DNA replication, but what makes it necessary? DNA replication is important because the information that is stored inside the DNA is essential for life, making DNA replication a process that is necessary for all living organisms. An example of where DNA replication is important is when there is a need to replace dead cells. If, for example, a cell dies, then the body should be able to replace this dead cell as soon as possible. And the only way to do that is to first copy the information that is inside that cell. Another example of the importance of DNA replication is when we are not able to copy the information in the DNA, then life would not continue as existing organisms would not be able to reproduce and to replace themselves. The reproduction of cells in an organism is dependent on DNA replication. Without DNA replication, then the information in the DNA would not be passed on and life would cease to exist. DNA replication also plays an important role in the growth and the renewal of cells. Growing organisms are constantly creating new cells as they develop into a larger body. And over time, these cells can become damaged, they can grow old, and they can die. And to keep your body functioning properly, it is important that these cells are replaced quickly with new ones. And to do this, we should first make a copy of a DNA or its own DNA, which has the genetic code it needs to function properly. It is very important that your DNA is replicated accurately with new cells receiving an exact copy of the genetic sequence. Let's now have a review of the different concepts that are important for you to understand and remember before we proceed with the DNA replication process. This will also serve as your review for the previous module. First of all, DNA replication happens during mitosis. Mitosis is when a cell splits or divides into two identical cells. That means these cells have the same DNA as the mother cell. Therefore, mitosis has the main function of DNA replication. To be more specific, DNA replication happens in the S phase or known as the synthesis phase. This is the phase before the cell enters into mitosis. Let's now talk about the DNA structure, specifically its structure as a nucleotide. The basic unit of a DNA is known as a nucleotide and the nucleotide is by itself a complex molecule as it is made up of three components. These three components are a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and a phosphate group. The sugar component of a nucleotide is a pentose with a five carbon atom. The particular pentose in a nucleotide is a two prime deoxyribose. There are two forms of pentose sugar, and this is the Fischer structure and the Haworth structure. The Fischer structure is a straight chain, while the Haworth structure is a ring form, and this is what is seen in a nucleotide. 
The five carbon atoms of a pentose sugar in a nucleotide is numbered from one prime to five prime. Now it's important to remember that they are not just numbered as one, two, three, four, and five, but as read as one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. With C1 prime after the oxygen and C5 prime located outside of the ring structure. The second component of a nucleotide is a nitrogenous base, and this can either be a single or a double ring structure. The nitrogenous base is connected to the sugar by a glycosidic bond. If a molecule is composed of a sugar and the nitrogenous base, then we call this molecule as a nucleoside. There are five types of nitrogenous bases, but only four of them are found in DNA. These five types may be categorized into two. We have the purines and the pyrimidines. Guanine and adenine are known as purines, which are double ringed structures, while cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines, which are only single ring structures. Thymine is only found on DNA, while uracil is only found on RNA. A nucleoside is converted into a nucleotide once a phosphate group is attached to the 5' prime carbon of the pentose sugar. Up to three individual phosphate groups may be attached in the series, and these are designated as alpha, beta, and the gamma phosphate group, with the alpha phosphate group being the one directly attached to the 5' prime carbon of the pentose sugar. So again, a nucleotide is made up of a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. Now there are four types of nucleotides which are named or which are classified according to the type of nitrogenous base that is attached to them. These four types are the 2 prime deoxyadenosine 5 prime triphosphate or DATP with adenine attached to it. The next one is 2 prime deoxyguanosine 5 prime triphosphate with guanine attached to the sugar. The third one is the 2 prime deoxycytidine 5 prime triphosphate with cytosine attached to the sugar and 2 prime deoxythymidine 5 prime triphosphate or DTTP with thymidine attached to the sugar. But writing the complete names and the abbreviated forms are still very tedious, especially when writing out a sequence of a nucleotide. Therefore, we just use the letters A, G, C, or T to refer to the type of nucleotide. Next that we have to learn is base pairing, and this would be in connection with the nucleotides being attached together, forming a polynucleotide. To build a DNA, the nucleotides must be linked together to make a polymer, and this polymer is known as a polynucleotide as it is made up of multiple nucleotides. To do this, we have to attach the different nucleotides together. One nucleotide is attached to another nucleotide by a phosphodiester bond. This bond is connected to the phosphate group of one nucleotide and the three prime sugar of the second nucleotide. One important feature of a polynucleotide that we should remember is that the two ends are not the same or that they are different. To explain this further, let's take a look at this picture. At the top of this polynucleotide is a free phosphate group because it is unreacted. There is no phosphodiester bond linking it to another nucleotide. This is now our 5' end 
or our five prime terminus or the five prime p terminus because of the free phosphate group at the five prime end. On the other end, we see a free hydroxyl group attached to the three prime of the sugar. This is now our three prime end or our three prime terminus or our three prime hydroxyl terminus. Distinguishing between the ends would give us the direction of a polynucleotide. In this case, we can say that this is a 5 prime to 3 prime going down. We can also say that this is a 3 prime to 5 prime going up. Here's another example of a polynucleotide, but this time we see the three prime hydroxyl group at the top as the free end. So this is our three prime end and the phosphate group at the bottom as our five prime end. To give the direction of this polynucleotide, we can say that this is the three prime to five prime going down or a five prime going to three prime going up. Combining two polynucleotides together will now form our DNA. And the backbone of this DNA is made up of the sugar and the phosphate group. So this is the sugar and the phosphate group being the backbone of the whole DNA. The nitrogenous bases are then extending outwards of the backbone of the DNA. In this simpler picture, this is the backbone of the DNA, which is made up of alternating sugar and phosphate groups with the nitrogenous base extending outwards. In living cells, DNA molecules almost always contain two polynucleotides and these two polynucleotides wrap around each other to form the famous double helix that was discovered by James Watson and Francis Crick in the year 1953. These two polynucleotides are described to be anti-parallel. This means that these polynucleotides run in different direction with the first polynucleotide running from five prime to three prime and the second nucleotide running from three prime to the five prime end. It's important that these polynucleotides are anti-parallel with each other so we can form a stable helix. As a recap, a DNA is made up of a double helix of two polynucleotides with one polynucleotide running from the five prime to three prime end and the second polynucleotide running from the three prime to the five prime end. And inside this helix is the nitrogenous basis, which brings us to our last concept, which is the DNA base pairing. When we say base pairing, we are referring to the nitrogenous bases that are connected or that are paired with each other. And these connections are made by hydrogen bonds, which are described to be weak electrostatic attractions. One thing that you have to remember with base pairing is that a purin will always be attached to a pyrimidine. And to remember which ones are the purines and the pyrimidines, I have this mnemonic. Adenine and guanine are purines, and the mnemonic that I remember is that all gods are pure. Now, since I know which ones are purines, then that means the other two nitrogenous bases would be the pyrimidines. Now, that's not only that, it becomes more specific because adenine, which is a purine, would only specifically bind to thymine, which is a pyrimidine. So that means adenine cannot bind to anything else except for the pyrimidine thymine. And cytosine will only attach to guanine. Adenine and thymine are formed with two hydrogen bonds, while guanine and cytosine are connected with three hydrogen bonds. 
one thing that is important is that if we know the sequence of one polynucleotide because of these nitrogenous bases, then we can also know the sequence of the other polynucleotide because one polynucleotide will determine the sequence of the other polynucleotide. And this is described as being complementary. And for our last topic in this video are the different replication hypotheses because for many years the scientists were not sure of how a cell replicated its DNA and there are three competing theories. These are the conservative, the semi-conservative, and the dispersive theories. The first theory, known as the conservative model, states that each of the polynucleotides in a DNA are used as a template strand. And with these template strands, a new DNA may be formed. But it doesn't end there. Somehow, after creating the new polynucleotides, the template strands get back together and the two new polynucleotides are the ones that are combined. So in the conservative model, we were able to conserve the original DNA while coming up with a second new DNA. The second theory is the semi-conservative model, which is the same as the conservative model, but only halfway through its process. So a DNA molecule uses each polynucleotide as a template, same as a conservative model, and with this template, a new polynucleotide will be formed. And that ends the semi-conservative method. So we have two new DNA strands, with each strand having a template strand and a newly formed polynucleotide. Finally, the third is the dispersive model where the original double helix is believed to be broken down into many small pieces. And these small pieces will end up with each new strand. The debate was finally resolved in 1958 by two scientists, Matthew and Franklin Stahl, in a now famous biology experiment. They discovered that a replicated DNA always contained one strand from the original DNA molecule and one strand that was newly formed. And this proved the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. So now we consider the semi-conservative model as a DNA replication model. And that is all for our introductory video for DNA replication. Next, please watch the DNA replication process. Thank you very much for watching.